Well, brothers and sisters, in the beginning of our gospel passage for today, we have this, this guy, this, this lawyer, this so-called expert in all things scriptural. And as St. Luke points out, this lawyer, he just stands up, gets up on two feet to test Jesus. And Jesus, of course, knows that he's being tested. And he knows that the lawyer knows the answer to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus allows the lawyer to answer the question himself. And the lawyer gives a response that's, hey, right on target. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, perfect answer. The lawyer, he does a good job in combining a passage from the book of Deuteronomy with a sentence from the book of Leviticus. And on this general level, Jesus, he, he doesn't add anything new to this age-old principle, this, this law of love, which grounds the Father's covenant with the people. Then the lawyer asks a second question, and this one's a little trickier to answer. And who is my neighbor, he says. Who is my neighbor? Now, at the time, the conventional response to this question, based on the letter of the law of the Old Testament, the conventional response was a fellow member of one's own nation or people, was a per person that would fit in the mold of neighbor. And yeah, for sure, there are, there are passages in the Old Testament that point to the welcoming of outsiders, and fair and peaceful treatment of foreign nationals, certainly when the conditions are right. Yet this exclusivist mentality developed over time. The words neighbor and foreigner didn't match. They became sort of opposing realities. And what did this give rise to? What, 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 what came about was this presumed license to offer charity to my people, but to treat those on the outside, like second-class citizens, individuals who were not favored by God. So why would they be favored by me? The whole mentality and misinterpretation of the radical nature of the covenant, it gave rise to this repelling away, this pushing away from fellow human beings, playing right into Satan's trap, his plan to divide and conquer. Now, having recognized this great flaw that had developed, this watering down and misinterpretation of the law of love, the core of the covenant, having acknowledged this human twisting that had developed, Jesus then shares this, this powerful parable, layered with meaning and arresting truth. And he does so as to what? Why does he, why does he share this parable? Well, one, to, to clear away any foggy misinterpretations of who my neighbor is, to, in, to incinerate any presumed license to withhold charity from any fellow human being, and to show you, to show me how to walk in Jesus' shoes, how to be a good neighbor to others. And for the protagonist, for the main character in his parable, who does Jesus choose? He chooses this foreigner, this outsider, this Samaritan man whom most Jews in Jesus' day would label as someone to be weary of. This very thick, palpable distrust of Samaritans had developed over the centuries. And even in the recent past, in Jesus' own day, sometime between the years 6 and 9 AD, according to one historian, it was a group of Samaritans who had taken upon themselves to defile the temple precincts in Jerusalem on the Feast of Passover. So this event further solidified the negative stereotypes directed toward these people from Samaria, a people who didn't even come close to falling underneath the umbrella of neighbor. So now what does Jesus do? He shares this parable, and its purpose is not just to break these negative stereotypes. Its purpose is also not just to show us who our neighbor is. It's also delivered to show us who I am, who you are, and to spur us into action. Now, at first, we can view ourselves as this man left for dead on the side of the road, you and me, 
subject to the harshness of the world and the effects of original sin that just plagues the world. And one of the great effects is this dehumanizing and alienating quality of personal sin. Brother turning a blind eye to brother. People who have convinced themselves that they have way more important matters to attend to. And then, and then the stranger approaches, looking for no recompense, offering aid out of the spirit of pure gratuity. He approaches. He approaches us. He approaches, he pours oil and wine over our wounds, bandages us, lifts us up, transports us to a safe place, stays there, continues to care for us, and then the next day pays the innkeeper to take care of us. We are the ones served by the good neighbor, the ultimate good neighbor, of course, Jesus Christ himself. And in his parable now, as Jesus teaches his, who, who, is, who is the good guy, this presumed enemy, a Samaritan, an outcast, but actually a neighbor to be cherished. And in the same parable, at another angle, you know, the lawyer, you, me, we're supposed to see ourselves as this healthy neighbor, not looking to avoid the situation, not looking for recompense, when charitable action is given, not even looking for a way to merit eternal life. No, it's just about getting out of ourselves and loving for the sake of loving, going the distance for the other because it's the right thing to do and it's the, mo and it's the most life-giving thing to do for them and for me, for you, for us. Reflecting on this scene, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, he once observed this. He said, the Samaritan enters the stage. What will he do? He does not ask how far his obligations of solidarity extend, nor does he ask about the merits required for eternal life. Something else happens. His heart is wrenched open, says Pope Benedict. And he continues, struck in his soul by the lightning flash of mercy, the Samaritan himself now becomes a neighbor heedless of any question or danger. The burden of the question thus shifts here. The issue is no longer which other person is a neighbor to me or not. The question is about me. I have to become the neighbor. And when I do, the other person counts for me as myself. Says Pope Benedict, I find what a profound insight here, this clarity that Pope Benedict offers us. He's, he's helping us to plunge into a deeper level in this marvelous teaching of our blessed Lord. And our Lord Jesus, what's he, what's he doing? Ultimately, he's bringing about this multi-layered change to the traditional concept of one's neighbor. And who's the neighbor in this scene? Well, at one angle, the neighbor is this man being beaten and left for dead. At another angle, the neighbor is this big-hearted foreigner, the Samaritan, who gets out of his comfort zone, a man who, by his example of ongoing charity, helps us to get out of our comfort zones. But who else is the neighbor? Well, it's, it's you, it's me, to be the neighbor to others. We are all called, Jesus is calling us, to all be neighbors. So in a way, after showcasing the fact that the brother and sisterhood of mankind is, is universal. It doesn't exclude any type of stranger or foreigner. After highlighting the dignity of everyone, Jesus, in a way, rephrases the lawyer's original question for him and for us. The original question was, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And the answer is, well, everybody, everyone is. Okay, that we get, but this this answer of everyone takes on a new depth of meaning when it's, when it's paired with a slightly different question. When that original question of who is my neighbor turns into whose neighbor can I be today and tomorrow? Whose neighbor can I be today and tomorrow? We can ask ourselves this today, brothers and sisters. Me, you, as Samaritan, as neighbor, good neighbor, with our hearts just wrenched open, allowing that mercy and love of God to flow through us, to impact others. You know, the lonely, the isolated, the suffering, the doubtful, 
the misinformed, the hopeless, the downtrodden, the victim, the person who annoys us, each of these people, these people, beloved daughters and sons of the Father, are all around us, out there and in here, in this church right now, our neighbors. And the reverse emphasis that Jesus is highlighting today is that rock-solid fact that we, that you, that I, am neighbor. You are neighbor for the other. You are neighbor to the beloved child of God whom our Lord has deliberately placed in your sphere of influence, who is not just worthy of your help, but they are deserving of your free, no-strings-attached, neighborly presence of ongoing charity by virtue of just who they are, not in virtue of what they have done, or how they have behaved, or how ugly their track record may be. It's not about that. Jesus, his lesson cuts through all of that. By virtue of who they are as beloved children of God, that, that makes me, that makes you their neighbor. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us.